Well, we got an interesting word from Paul Aney a moment ago. Uh, uh, the Borman Lovell Anders team so far hasn't been a bundle of laughs up there. They've been pretty busy, of course. Uh, there hasn't been much uh, banter back and forth, although the communications channels are, are great. But a moment ago, uh, Borman uh, reporting uh, in over the Canary Islands uh, identified the uh, spacecraft as Gemini 8. And uh, it caused a little bit of a laugh in uh, mission control. He was working one uh, flight segment behind with the Gemini flights. This, of course, is Apollo 8, and there's quite a bit of difference. We are told also a moment ago that TASS, the uh, Soviet news agency, had uh, given a rather detailed and rapid uh, report uh, from, the, uh, from the states here to the Russian newspaper, which pretty much was tied in which is, did carry the launch of Apollo 8 live, uh, did not do so. There has been no television schedule on the uh, Soviet uh, system of the uh, launching today so far. Perhaps the Russians are waiting until uh, Apollo 8 actually succeeds in circumnavigating uh, the moon. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment. Two and a half hours after that perfect liftoff, came the historic decision, go for the moon. Here's what's going to happen on this firing in just a few minutes now, in uh, about 15 minutes of the third stage engine. This is what's now up in orbit. Uh, the third stage engine, the service module, and the command module. This engine is the one that is fired once to uh, finally boost the this complex into Earth orbit. That's a 230,000 pound thrust J2 engine. It was four engines just like that that powered the second stage of the Saturn as well. This worked perfectly in boosting into orbit, and now if it works as perfectly, it will boost the rest of this space operation uh, into the translunar in, uh, trajectory. It will stay attached there for 13 or 14 minutes or so after its five minute burn. But then, uh, finally, the service module and the command module will separate, come out like this. They'll go out uh, just a short distance and turn around and station keep with the uh, third stage. Now, the reason for this is to get some photos of the opening of the three panels around here that blossom out, four panels that blossom out uh, and fall away. Those panels must fall away, and this model does not exactly operate that way, but that would be it. They fall open and leave a small cone here, which also does not quite show in this model, a docking cone. Now, on future flights, when we go to the moon with the lunar uh, module that lands on the moon, the the spacecraft will come in, attach to that lunar module, and pull it free. Well, pull it free. I hope it works better than the model, like that. At that point, it pulls this bug loose. Between those two models, between these two spacecraft, there is a passageway. Two of the uh, astronauts go through that passageway and into the lunar model. When they get to the moon, they, they then fly to the moon in this configuration. They get to the moon, they separate again, and this goes down and lands on the moon. It's these, these little feet spread out. It lands on the moon, like that, on the moon. This continues to circle the moon. The men climb out of this, complete their mission on the moon, and then using this as a launch pad. Actually, I'm missing part of this model is what the problem is. Uh, they, they blast off with the top half of this lunar model module and come back up to join again with the, uh, the Apollo command module. Join back in, the two men climb back through, take their places, drop away the lunar excursion module, and the entire affair comes back to Earth. When they get back to Earth, as they do in this particular flight, finally, the command module separates from the service module, and just at this end, the command module comes back to Earth in that fiery reentry of 25,000 miles per hour, some 7,500 miles an hour faster than uh, uh, any man has come back from space before. 
Here is the rest of that model, which was missing when I suddenly tried to take it out a moment ago. It looks like that as it comes down on the moon. And this part blasts back up and comes back to the command module. Now, this is not being flown in this flight. This fairing is on there as they now fly, waiting for the time to ignite the stage three. That fairing is on there. They're going to come separate, turn around, take a look, and take a picture as that fairing falls away. Because in the Apollo 7 flight, the fairing caught. One of the four panels stayed uh, in a, uh, it didn't distend entirely. And that might have caused an abort in a moon mission if they had had to go in and try to pick up the, uh, the lamp. Uh, since that was not necessary on the Apollo 7 flight, uh, no harm was done. But they want to be sure that this fairing is operating properly. So they want to get some pictures of it this time. In there, this, on this flight, there has been only uh, dummy weight, uh, water actually, uh, to uh, simulate the lamp. The production of the lunar model has been delayed somewhat, and that's why this mission it was decided to go out and take a look at the landing spots and photograph them uh, on the moon, test the moon mission without a lunar excursion module. But now Apollo 9, which is expected to go in late February or early March, will take a lunar excursion module into Earth orbit and practice with it this technique of pulling it loose, of it detaching itself, the men going through it, the passageway and all that sort of thing in Earth orbit. And then Apollo 10, uh, probably in the middle of May, will go out to the moon and practice landings down to 50,000 feet, but not actually land on the moon, unless perhaps they get daring and decide to go ahead with a moon landing as early as May or June. This time, they'll take the look. Once they've had that look, this, uh, the, the spacecraft will move away, get out of range, and the S-4B will begin to vent uh, the propellants that remain in its tanks, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, venting those uh, propellants, that is just uh, uh, push, pumping them overboard, will give it added uh, uh, velocity so that it will go on out and circle the moon itself. Not completely circle the moon, but come around the near side of the moon and fly on out into solar orbit, being lost in space. While the spacecraft goes on to the uh, the forward side of the moon and around to the back side where the firing takes place to put it into lunar orbit. That's kind of a long and probably deta too detailed explanation telling you more than you want to know about how this is all going to take place. But that's the way it is. The firing of those engines is now about uh, nine minutes away. We're going to wait for further word uh, from the spacecraft now over Australia on its way out toward the Pacific and the firing which comes over Hawaii at 10.41 our time if it's on schedule. Terry Drinkwater at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is with Harold uh, Masorski of the U.S. Geological Survey uh, which has as part of its job the study of pictures of the moon returned to Earth by unmanned spacecraft, the Ranger and the Surveyor and the orbiters. Uh, Terry, I wonder what you can uh, and Mr. Mazorski can tell us about the pictures of the moon. Let's hope that the Apollo 8 crew is going to bring back after those hoped for 10 orbits. Apparently have an audio problem there with uh, picking up Terry Drinkwater. At uh, you can hear me, I'm not hearing you. Uh, so we'll stand. Mr. Will while I hope get the report on those earlier pictures. Perhaps as we wait for that firing of the of the third stage for the translunar injection.